just want to share with you all this morning, you know, Nelson's been in a series where he's talking about worship. And last week, he really talked about the fact, just the fact that worship not only occurs here, but worship occurs out there. And we're here during this one hour of time focusing on God, but what does the rest of our life look like? And so this morning, we're going to look at the book, um, chapter 14 of John, and we're going to dig into what Jesus is telling us. Because what we know is that he is giving us hope, and he is giving us direction through the 14 verses that we're going to look at this morning. And we're really going to pay close attention to them. And what I want you to do, I want everybody to look at me because I, I really want you to, to focus on something this morning. And what I want you to focus on is setting an expectation of what you would like this worship to be for you. I want you to think about how you can gain through the words and through the rhythm of the song a relationship with God. I want you to think about how you can gain a relationship and grow that relationship with God and others through the words that we hear this morning. And I think if we set an expectation, then we're, we're better off leaving this place with something that we can carry with us. So not only do I want this to be a time where we're celebrating God and praising God and understanding God and recognizing God to be here, but I also want it to be a time where we can grow in our relationship with God and we can take that with us. Because what we're going to see is that through the message this morning, we can gain hope and we can gain direction of what we're called to be as a Christian. And I think you're going to get really excited about the words this morning if we can see how they can apply in our lives. If you can take them and put them in your heart and carry them with you and recognize what Jesus is calling the disciples to do, and he's also speaking to us through the book of John this morning. So I want you right now to set in your mind, what is my expectation of today's worship? Not only what I can gain, but how I can grow in my relationship with God. He has come and prepared this house for worship because He wants our minds and our hearts to be focused on Him. And if we're sitting in the pew thinking about lunch or something that happened yesterday, then we're missing an opportunity to grow in our relationship with God. So I want you right now to think, what is my expectation of this worship experience? How will I experience God? How can I seek Him? Through the song and through the giving and through the table and through the word. So that we can grow together to bring light into this world. So I want to share a little bit of background before I get into the scripture about what's going on right before this. So we're going to be looking at John chapter 14 verses 1 through 14. But prior to that, Jesus had gathered with the disciples for the last supper. And he met with the disciples and he knew what was about to happen. He understood, he understood that that was going to be his last supper. They did not because they were gathered for Passover. But he knew what was about to happen. And during this time, I want you to think about three things that occurred. So Jesus understands he's with the disciples for the last time that they'll break bread together. And this is when it happens. He identifies Judas that he's going to betray him. He calls him out and sends him off. He lets Peter know that he's going to deny him three times before the rooster crows. And then to top that off, the disciples get into a little argument about who's going to be the greatest when they get to heaven. So here's Jesus, knowing that it's going to be the last time he breaks bread with them, and he's got to call out Judas for betraying him, he's got to call out Peter for denying him, and he's got to calm down the little baby boys that are fighting who has the biggest ego and who's going to be celebrating in heaven and who's going to be the greatest when we get there. Does that sound like a festive last supper for Jesus? No. Thank you, Cheyenne. I agree with you. I believe that Jesus is sitting around the table saying, these guys just don't get it. They just don't get it. And you know, put yourself in that place. But we get it. Yes, we traveled around with him for three years, but what were they thinking? They were thinking that he was going to be a mighty king that would overthrow the Romans. Not that he was going to be the king of eternity. They were kind of thinking that they were right there with him as he marched through. 
through to destroy and wipe out those that had kept them up with their thumb. And he was thinking, man, these guys just don't understand what it's all about. They just don't understand. So now let's open our Bibles. We're going to turn to chapter 14 in the book of John. And we're going to read 1 through 14. And it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Then Thomas said in verse 5, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. May God bless the reading of his word. So what's going on here is that they've left the Last Supper and they're walking to the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus is having this conversation with the disciples. And he understands what is about to happen, but they don't. And so there's three things that I want to focus on that comes from the Scriptures today. And if you have your, your worship bulletin and you want to take notes there, it's an open page. The first thing I want you to write down is trust in me. Trust in me. The second thing will be, follow me. The third thing will be, call on me. And we're going to carry, cover these three points today. And I want you to think about John 14, the very first verse. And it says, Jesus is talking to the disciples. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. I want you to think about what's happened here. You see, Jesus has given the disciples kind of some hope and some comfort. They know that they've disappointed him by the conversations that they just had about Judas and about Peter and about them arguing over who's going to be the greatest. They understand that they've disappointed Jesus. But Jesus says, that's okay. You're going to be forgiven. What I want you to do is not worry about that burden. What I want you to do is trust in me. And I think not only was he talking to the disciples then, but he's talking to each one of us as well. Because I think there's probably everybody in here has disappointed Jesus in some way or another through their walk. And sometimes we carry that around with us and it prevents us from being what God's called us to be. And what Jesus is saying is, leave that burden behind and trust in me. You know, when I think of the words trust, a vision comes to mind. Anybody in here Indiana Jones fans? Yeah? Y'all like those movies? There's one called The Last Crusade. And this is the image that I get when it comes to trust. So there's a point in the movie where Indiana Jones is trying to find the chalice that Christ drank from in the Last Supper. And he's kind of going through these caves and there's all these stones that he's got to step on and he has to do things in the right sequence. And he goes through a little tiny cave and he's going through there and it's, he kind of steps out. And there's an opening, and he sees the cave right across from him where the chalice is supposed to be stored. The challenge is, he looks straight down, and there's a cliff, and it's so far down he can't see the bottom. 
and he looks across 20 feet to where the opening is, and there's another cliff on that side that's straight down and he can't see the bottom. And there's nothing in between. Y'all remember that scene in the movie? So he's sitting there and he's looking at a book, and the book is supposed to be giving him directions as to how to get to this, the sequence of things. And he looks and there's a picture in the book of someone stepping out into that abyss. And then you hear his father in the background say, you got to believe. you got to believe. So Indiana Jones takes the book and he folds it and puts it in his backpack. Takes a deep breath. Puts his foot up. He holds it there for a second because he's not quite sure. And then it's like he gives a little bit of hope. And he steps into the abyss. And right when his foot goes down, like he would fall, a stone bridge appears and connects the two sides. And I believe that's exactly what Jesus is saying to the disciples. Trust in me. Trust in me. Believe in me. And take that step. And when you take that step, I'll be there to carry you on. You don't have to do it by yourself. Trust in me. Yes, you're going to make mistakes. Leave that burden behind and trust in me. So the first point that I want us to carry away today is that we need to rely on Jesus Christ. We can't do it by ourselves because when the disciples tried to do it by themselves, they betrayed Jesus. They denied Jesus. They argued amongst themselves because the focus wasn't on Christ. The focus was on self. And we have to have the confidence and the belief and, and the willingness to turn it over to Jesus and say, Follow me. Look at verse 4. Jesus says, You know the way to the place where I am going. It does not say you will know the way or eventually will find the way. It says you already know the way. Follow me. You see, they were with him for three years. They watched what he did. What did he do? He loved the marginalized. He reached out and he cared for those people that didn't feel love. Is that an example for what we should be doing in our life? He encouraged other people. Is that an example for what we should be doing in our life? He loved God and he turned everything over to God. And he loved people. And he got the power from God to love those that maybe others didn't love. And we probably face some of those people in our lives that we just find hard to love. But God says love them anyway. And how? By following the example that Jesus Christ set for us. So not only are we supposed to trust Him, but now He calls us to follow Him. And the funny part is, the disciples continue to question Him. He's given them everything. He's, they've been with Him for three years. They've witnessed His life, but yet they continue to question Him. So it says here, I'm really sorry about that. Thomas, Thomas questions him. I, I just, I don't understand. What do you mean you're going somewhere and we're supposed to know where that is? What do you mean you're going and you're preparing and we're supposed to know where that is? And Jesus is saying, Thomas, don't you understand? You've been with me. You know me. You know me. I'm God with you. That's what he's telling them. I'm God with you. Why is it that you're having a hard time to understand this? And then he's questioning again. And he says, show us the Father. Because he said, Christ said he was going to be with the Father. And he said, show us the Father. And he said, I am the Father. If you know me, then you will know God because we are one. Again, let's put ourselves in their place. What are they thinking? They're thinking that this is a king that came to save the world for them. They're not thinking about a king that is God. They're not thinking about a king that came to be their eternal savior. They're only thinking about them having a great life. And they're now seeing that he's talking about leaving and going somewhere else. 
Put yourself in that place. I gave up my family. I gave up my occupation. I've been following you for three years, and now you're telling me you're going somewhere else? Well, wait a minute. Where are you going? I told you where I'm going. What do you mean? You're going to be with your father, and you're going to prepare a place for me. What, what does that mean? You've been with me. If you know me, you know the father. Follow me. Follow me. Well, how do I follow you? You do the things that I did. How do I follow you? You do the things that I have done over the last three years. Love people. Get out of your own way. Get out of your own mind. You have the confidence through me to love people. I'm speaking to each one of us here today. Because I think right now, if we, if we think real hard, we had opportunities to love on people this past week. We had opportunities to reach out to people that were hurt this week. And we didn't take the time to do it. Because I'm too busy. <clears throat> too busy to do that. Was Jesus ever too busy? So what's he told us so far? He's told us a couple things. Trust in me. Follow me. And here's the one that I love the most. You're not excited about this one. This is the one that I love the most because this is where I get my passion and my energy and my excitement. You know, I haven't seen it yet, but it's getting ready to come. <laughs> the third thing he says is, call on me. Call upon my name and I will be there for you always. Call upon my name when you're going through anything and I will be there. And you know, as I was preparing the sermon, I started thinking about it. I'd always told my kids growing up, if you ever need anything, you call on me and I'll be here for you. Anything at all, anytime, it doesn't matter. If you need me, I will be here for you. And then I started thinking about the different voices of my children associated with when they call me. The, first, the very first one I thought about was my daughter Sarah when she was probably about six or seven years old. My wife and I were over there at Patrick Henry track and we were walking around the track and she was riding her bicycle. And all of a sudden, she, somebody had put a boulder out in the middle of the track, and she didn't see it. She hit that boulder on the bicycle. And she went over the handlebars, and the first thing to hit the ground was her face. And Betsy and I were at the other end of the track, and I could hear with all her heart screaming out, Daddy! And I ran as fast as I could to be with her, and it still gives me shrills to think about what she went through during that time. The pain that she was in, and the fact that she called out to me. And then I think about the voice of my girls when I would come home from work, and actually they still do this. Sarah's 23 years old, and I walk in the door, and she says, Daddy's home, Daddy's home, Daddy's home! <laughs> oh, I love to hear that. Another voice calling out to the Father. But this time, not in a voice of pain, but a voice of celebration. And then uh, my cell phone rings, and it's, it's my son on the other end, and I'm, hey, buddy, how you doing? Dad. Different voice. Different reason for calling upon the Father. But in all three scenarios, whether it's pain, whether it's celebration, whether it's confusion, needing help, we're called to call on our Father for all of those same scenarios. And we treasure it as a parent when we hear it from our child. I can't imagine the elation that God has when we call upon His name in all of those circumstances. You see, Jesus is telling the disciples that you need to trust in me. That you need to follow me and do what I did. And that no matter what you're going through, call upon my name and I will be there for you. I will be there to lift you up, to encourage, to put my arms around you, to celebrate with you, to commiserate with you, to heal your heart when it's hurting. He'll be there for everything. But you know what? It's up to us for that to happen. He's there waiting for us to call upon His name. And then He's always, always there. So the question we need to ask
ask ourselves now is, where are we in our relationship with God? Are we willing to trust in Him, to turn it over, to eliminate the burdens in our life and the mistakes in our life and give them over to Him and just trust in Him that He's going to lead God and direct us? Are we willing to follow Him and to say, you know what, this day is not about me, but this day is about God. Whether we're here in worship or you're in the workplace or you're at home, make that day, make that time about God, not about self. Because if we make it about self, we're going to be just like the disciples. We're going to deny Him, right? We're going to disappoint. Be strong. Call on the name of the Lord. When you're facing those things in your life that are battles, call upon the name of the Lord. When you have something to celebrate, call upon the name of the Lord. When you're in anguish and you're not quite sure what to do next, call upon the name of the Lord. And He will be there for you. Right. 